He was a mafia boss unlike any other. He was cocky and flamboyant, and he had an uncanny ability to beat every rap lawmen threw at him. You find him not guilty. But as boss of the Gambino crime family, John Gotti was guilty of ordering the killing of anyone who dared question his absolute authority. He's a murderer. He's not a folk hero. John Gotti denies he's part of any mafia. He denies he committed these crimes. John Gotti, first the Dapper Don, then the Teflon Don, perhaps the mob's last kingpin. This is Crime Stories. I'm Richard Belzer. The true story of John Gotti's rise to power has made him a legend in his own lifetime. John Gotti, the outspoken and the well-groomed godfather, claimed he was just a plumbing supply salesman from Queens. Prosecutors alleged he was really a bloodthirsty crime lord who used intimidation and murder to stay in power. Why did it take the government so long to finally conquer the man once known as the Teflon Don? February 1990. It's a chaotic scene outside the Manhattan District Courthouse. John Gotti, the reputed boss of the Gambino crime family, follows his hulking bodyguards down the courthouse steps to a waiting Cadillac. Reporters vainly shout their questions at the mob's most popular spokesman. There's a whole mess of factors which combine to make John Gotti a folk hero. But the single most prevailing reason, I believe, is that he was acquitted three times. You guys and Giuliani should be in church. State and federal prosecutors believe Gotti rules a conglomerate of crime that operates throughout New York City and beyond. Investigators believe he stays in power the same way he became boss, by ordering the killing of anyone who dares to question his authority. In an attempt to end Gotti's reign, Investigators by early 1990 are redoubling their efforts to bring Gotti down. The FBI has secretly bugged one of his favorite hangouts, the Ravenite Club in the Little Italy section of Manhattan. In late 1990, tapes of Gotti's conversations in an apartment above the Ravenite convince a federal grand jury to indict him again. On December 11th, Gotti and three associates are arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit murder, bribery, obstruction of justice, operating illegal gambling casinos, and tax fraud. If you think the rule of law means anything, if you think fairness and everybody playing by the rules means anything, a guy like Gotti is, is just, he's acid in your heart. In the four years leading up to his 1990 arrest, Gotti has become a folk hero. Many New Yorkers cheer his not guilty verdicts. They applaud his flashy public style the $2,000 suits, the carefully coiffed hair, the way he struts when he's out on the town. Somehow, this reputed head of a vast criminal enterprise is one of the most popular people in New York. Here was this guy uh, defying the law time and again, defying the city of New York, and bathing in all the uh, adulation he was getting from his fans. And he had thousands of fans. It is a dramatic ascent for a man who came from little. John Gotti is born in the Bronx in 1940. His parents eventually have 13 children. John Jr. is the third of their seven sons. Because his father gambles and provides little for the family, young John learns to fend for himself. He was good with his hands. He could take care of himself one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one and even two-on-one. -on -one. He, uh, he was, uh, you know, uh, the kind of guy who um, he walked with a swagger and he could back it up uh, when he had to. Gotti's boyhood role model is local crime boss Albert Anastasia. One lesson Gotti learns from him is that mafia bosses rarely die in their sleep. On October 25th, 1957, Anastasia is murdered in the barbershop of Manhattan's Park Sheraton Hotel. Informants tell police the mastermind of the hit is Anastasia's underboss, Carlo Gambino. 
By the mid-1960s, Gambino is firmly in control. That's also when John Gotti starts working with one of the crime family's so-called crews in Queens. It's one of the more vicious and ruthless crews in the family. Uh, their specialty was uh, street crimes, they're into truck hijackings, car thefts. John F. Kennedy Airport is located just a few miles from the Queens neighborhood where Gotti's crew has set up its headquarters. Gotti inaugurates his mob career by hijacking cargo from the airline's freight docks. But in 1968, the FBI catches him trying to steal a load of women's dresses. Gotti's troubles seem to mount when state investigators identify him as a suspect in another airport heist. Gotti is sentenced to Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary, but by being arrested and imprisoned, Gotti actually enhances his standing with his mafia superiors. In the old mafia days, you had to work your way up from the bottom. You had to demonstrate loyalty and an ability to commit some crimes and do a little jail time. And that's when the mob bosses began to recognize you as somebody that they could trust and bring closer into the family and basically give more power to. Gotti leaves prison in 1972 and returns to Queens. He rejoins his crew at their headquarters, a nondescript place known as the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. In 1973, Carlo Gambino gives Gotti an important assignment. Gambino wants revenge for the murder of his nephew. This was a, uh, an, you know, the ideal opportunity for John Gotti to show his worth and to prove that he could do what was necessary and whatever had to be done, you know, to uh, become a made guy. The target of Gambino's revenge, James McBratney, is shot dead in a Staten Island bar in May of 1973. A year later, police arrest Gotti and two other men for McBratney's murder. Gambino repays Gotti's loyalty by hiring well-known attorney Roy Cohn to defend him. Cohn had made his reputation 20 years earlier as Senator Joseph McCarthy's right-hand man. By the mid-70s, Cohn has represented a number of high-profile mob defendants. Cohn uses his considerable contacts and skills to plea bargain the charges against Gotti from murder to attempted manslaughter. Gotti goes to prison for just two years. When John went to jail, that sort of was his way of catapulting himself into the big time, into the big arena, that he had killed somebody, he had gone to jail for the mob. In October of 1976, while John Gotti sits in prison, Carlo Gambino dies of a heart attack. His funeral brings out hundreds of men from all five of New York's mafia crime families. Among them, Gambino's anointed successor. He's a cousin of Gambino's named Paul Castellano. After serving two years, Gotti is released from prison in July of 1977. Castellano agrees he has earned full membership in the Gambino family. Before long, Castellano makes Gotti acting boss of his crew in Queens. But Castellano doesn't realize that promoting Gotti seals his own fate. Their deadly confrontation next, when Crime Stories continues. Crime Stories continues on Court TV. In the early 1980s, investigators learn that John Gotti is the captain, or capo, of a crew in the Gambino family. His headquarters are in Queens, at the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. The leader of a crew in a major organized crime family in a city like New York is a heady, powerful thing. There's a lot of money. It's a, uh, it, uh, it's, it, it's sort of like in the movies, the cachet of uh, a bit of fame, fortune, and uh, swashbuckling lifestyle. Neil Della Croce, Castellano's right-hand man, is underboss of the Gambino family. He is John Gotti's immediate superior. John Gotti and his gang from Queens under Neil de la Croce were part of the blue collar wing of the crime family. Paul Castellano, uh, Sammy Gravano, and the guys from Staten Island and Brooklyn were more the white collar crowd, the people involved in the uh, uh, labor racketeering, uh, making money uh, as tough guys, but more or less uh, uh, using their brains as well as their brawn. Paul Castellano runs the Gambino criminal empire from his fortress-like mansion on Staten Island. John Gotti was terrified of Castellano. Sometimes he gets summoned up to, they call it the White House, to meet with Castellano, and he never knew it was about it. He would be very apprehensive going up there. Is he in trouble? Are they going to whack him? 
Gotti begins openly criticizing Castellano for being reclusive and greedy. He's right. All those capos were bringing him up sacks of money every week, every month. His income was two or three hundred thousand dollars a month, and it still wasn't enough. He was one greedy bastard, that Paul Castellano. He wanted to sort of become more a chairman of a board kind of guy, and, and he dusted off the more dirty aspects of organized crime. He basically tried to legitimize his ill-gotten gains. And that was something that bothered John Gotti. John Gotti isn't afraid to play dirty. In 1983, Gotti's brother, Gene, and their pal, Angelo Ruggiero, are indicted for heroin trafficking. Ruggiero's ties to Gotti go all the way back to the 50s, when they were teenage toughs in Brooklyn. But now, Ruggiero's inability to keep his mouth shut is about to get him in trouble with Castellano. The Gambino boss has heard rumors the FBI has Ruggiero on tape, talking about selling heroin. If that's true, Castellano says he will order Ruggiero killed for violating a Gambino family code against dealing drugs. Gotti is caught in the middle as Castellano pushes him to get transcripts of the tapes from Ruggiero and his lawyer. The push uh, became a little bit of shove in 1984 and 1985, and that's when he really put the squeeze on John Gotti for the tapes. But before Castellano gets the tapes, he's hit with two federal indictments. The first is for racketeering, murder conspiracy, auto theft, and drug dealing. The second comes when a grand jury indicts the bosses of all five of New York's mafia families. Rudy Giuliani, the ambitious U.S. attorney, tells reporters he's filing the so-called commission case under a federal statute known as RICO for racketeer-influenced corrupt organizations. The RICO statute is a perfect remedy for organized crime that's divided the way the mafia is divided into families because it permits you to indict an entity, not just an individual. Gotti himself faces RICO charges in 1985. A Brooklyn federal grand jury accuses Gotti, his mentor Neil Della Croce, and others of running a criminal enterprise, the Gambino crime family. Paul Castellano tells his aides he expects to lose his case. Before that happens, Castellano says, he will designate someone to carry out his orders while he's in prison. In the summer of 1985, Castellano summons Gotti to a meeting. He learned that Paul Castellano had decided to move Tommy Bellotti up to the underboss spot. Uh, John Gotti's crew was going to be uh, broken apart. He was going to move the people around in the crew and put them with other, uh, other captains. Tommy Bellotti is Castellano's driver and bodyguard. To John Gotti, he's nothing more than an errant boy, hardly someone who deserves to be underboss. Worse, Gotti hears rumors that once his crew is disbanded, Castellano may have him killed. Gotti decides to make the first move. Well, Gotti was smart enough to know he couldn't pull it off all by himself. I mean, you just don't go kill the boss of a crime family, no matter how tough you are. One of the first men Gotti asks for help is a Castellano loyalist named Salvatore Gravano. Street name, Sammy the Bull. Gravano believes the future lies with Gotti and agrees to help get rid of Castellano. The conspiracy to kill him ultimately includes five men. John Gotti had willing accomplices in that Castellano wing because uh, Paul had this uh, aura about him and you know the bottom line is he did forget that he was a gangster. Through the fall of 1985, Gotti waits for a chance to get Castellano. Gotti and his mentor, Neil Della Croce, are supposed to go to trial on December 2nd to face federal RICO charges. But on that very day, Della Croce dies of cancer. Neil Della Croce's death was uh, probably the single most important day in many ways for John Gotti because he sort of saw him as his father. That was his father figure in the mob. With Della Croce gone, Paul Castellano can now move at will against John Gotti. But the Gambino boss hesitates, giving Gotti time to attack first. The hit is set when Gotti learns that Castellano has planned a meeting for December 16th at Sparks Steakhouse, his favorite restaurant on Manhattan's east side. The plan for the hit is simple but daring. Gotti and Gravano will have their men shoot Castellano and his new underboss, Tommy Bellotti, as soon as Bellotti parks Castellano's car at the restaurant's front door. He had four shooters right in front of the restaurant. They're the primary shooters to take care of Castellano and Bellotti. He had a backup shooter across the street. 
He had some uh, backup shooters and crash cars on the other block from Sparks, just in case Castellano and Blotti drove, spotted the hit team, drove by, they could catch him there. Just before 5.30 p.m., Gotti's team takes up positions outside the restaurant. Castellano and Blotti drove through the light, parked in front, and the four members of the hit team descended on the car. All four fired their weapons and they were killed instantly. The shooters disappear into the night. Terrified pedestrians run for cover past the bodies of Paul Castellano and Tommy Bellotti. Following the hit, Gotti and Gravano drove by, saw it was done. They all went back to Gravano's office, and then they all went home to watch the evening news. New York City is shocked by the bold recklessness of the murders. The middle of the street and the exclusive Upper East Side. And you knew that John Gotti was at the center of it. It was on the level of something he would love. The grand hit in a public place in the middle of Midtown at 5 o'clock rush hour. It fit John Gotti. News reports speculate that John Gotti will eventually take over the Gambino crime family. Within two weeks, just before the end of 1985, Gotti is formally elected boss of the Gambino family. A new chapter in mafia history is about to begin. The era of the Dapper Don. We now return to Crime Stories on Court TV. Shortly after Paul Castellano's murder outside Sparks Steakhouse in New York, John Gotti takes over as boss of the Gambino crime family in late 1985. Gotti inherits a hugely profitable enterprise. Government investigators say the illegal operations he oversees gross an estimated $500 million a year. Gotti's reach extends across an impressive array of activities from control of seafood and meat distribution to building construction, trucking in Manhattan's garment district and private garbage haulers. From Gotti's headquarters on Manhattan's Mulberry Street, he controls everything from loan sharking to pornography. The public gets its first good look at John Gotti in January of 1986, when reporters cover his impending RICO trial in Brooklyn. Reporters would ask him, you know, are you the boss of the crime family? Uh, did you kill Paul Castellano? And his responses, he was quick with the one-liners uh, back then. Uh, um, I'm the boss of my wife and kids at home. Uh, I don't know uh, who killed him. Gotti's smoothness includes the way he dresses and his apparent ease in front of news cameras. John Gotti acquires a new title, the Dapper Don. At first, we thought of him as more of a joke in the sense that here's a guy who has seen The Godfather too many times. He actually tries to dress like he thinks a mobster should dress, not based on reality, because we knew how mobsters really dressed. He would uh, almost uh, conduct himself the way a politician would when he wouldn't want to answer any important questions, just smile and keep walking and yes, everybody, and just manage to get to a position where he knew he couldn't be bothered any longer. And like a politician, Gotti's confidence grows with every victory. His first courtroom triumph as boss of the Gambino crime family comes in March of 1986. Gotti is accused of assaulting a man named Romuel Pisic during a 1984 dispute over a double parked car. But when Pisic takes the stand, he says he can't remember who hit him. The victim in the case decided there's no way I'm going to testify against John Gotti. This is the ultimate gangster here. He's all over television as the number one guy. No way I'm going to uh, testify against him and point him out in court. So he just refused. I mean, he was terrified, rightly so. With no witness, the case is thrown out, and the New York Post's memorable headline makes many people wonder if Gotti successfully intimidated Pisic. That case, in my mind, had no, it was no intervention on John Gotti's behalf. It was the media hype that caused this witness to, to be reticent on the stand. At least, that's what the witness told us in an affidavit, which we filed. Gotti has little time to enjoy his first victory. A few months later, his trial on RICO charges begins in Brooklyn Federal Court. Jury selection is underway when disaster strikes. A powerful bomb planted in this car kills Gotti's underboss, Frank DeChico. Gotti tells his men and police he has no idea who did it or why. Why that was perplexing is because DeChico really turned out not to be the target. The target, in fact, was John Gotti. The man who has it in for Gotti is the boss of the Genovese crime family, Vincent Chin Gigante. He has never forgiven Gotti for eliminating Castellano without permission from the other crime family bosses. Whacking the head of, of the biggest organized crime family in the country without permission from the other bosses 
uh, is always going to be just an outrageously dangerous thing, even if you do it at midnight in a back alley. Yep. Mr. Gotti, are you ready? Are you ready for trial? But in May of 1986, it is the federal government, not another crime family, that concerns John Gotti. He is held without bail until his trial begins in August. Prosecutor Diane Giacalone's case rests largely on the testimony of criminals who've made deals for reduced sentences. Gotti's defense attorney, Bruce Cutler, who's developing his own reputation for outrageous courtroom behavior, has a field day destroying the credibility of the government's witnesses. On Friday, March 13, 1987, the jury acquits Gotti of all charges. The jury's job was to decide whether or not the defendants were guilty. They did their job, and that is the end of that. When the acquittals came, everybody was in shock. Uh, I was just hoping for a hung jury. But prosecutors and the FBI are hearing rumors that at least one juror may have taken money to vote in Gotti's favor. We knew at the time that there are attempts at jury tampering, because the Gotti crew is famous for that. Several years later, Sammy Gravano testifies that he funneled $60,000 to one of the jurors. Gravano says the payoff went through this Yugoslavian native who ran a gang on New York's west side. But Gotti's attorney still maintains it never happened. They never found this Yugoslavian fella who was the alleged go-between. They never proved that this Yugoslavian fella ever gave any money to this juror. But this uh, poor juror was convicted. From the beginning of his reign as Gambino boss, Gotti resorts to force to keep his troops in line. The first victim is a Gambino associate named Robert DiBernardo. We knew once John Gotti became boss, if somebody was in trouble, John would snap his fingers, do it, clip him, and they'd do it like the next day. With Gotti now head of the Gambino crime family, the FBI increases its surveillance of his activities. Agents believe, but cannot yet prove, that Gotti was behind the killings of Paul Castellano and Tommy Bellotti. I spoke with hundreds of people who we knew, based on all sorts of investigation, had been on the street at the time. And they would all look at you right in the face, and they would say, I didn't see a thing. After Gotti's first federal trial ends in disaster for the government, investigators agree their next case must be airtight. The FBI has two goals to develop informants close to Gotti, and second, to use the informant's tips to place wiretaps where Gotti might be talking about committing crimes. They're not stupid, and they know that we know where their social clubs are, so they always have private places to have these conversations. Gotti makes it easy for the FBI to find him. He runs his empire from a small social club called The Ravenite on Mulberry Street in Little Italy. Every day he'd go down the run 4.30, 5 o'clock, and he'd hold court there until 8.30, 9 o'clock at night into this Monday through Friday. The FBI sets up a video surveillance camera down the street and collects hundreds of hours of mafia interaction. Investigators conclude John Gotti's leisurely strolls up and down Mulberry Street are his way of conducting Gambino crime family business. If you're going to run this business, you have to do it orally. And if you're going to talk about the real nitty gritty of running the business, which is extortion, murder, mayhem, you've got to talk about it. Remember, this is a business. You can't write a memo. You know, kill Louie on Tuesday, you know, CC, you know, all the other capos. With no written records, the process of gathering evidence against Gotti goes slowly. But investigators are in no hurry. John Gotti spends much of 1987 and 88 becoming a New York sensation. The public had a love affair in a way with John Gotti. They saw the, uh, the flashy nature and the humor, the humor in the mob, you know, the funny side of the mob. Oh, of course, they intimidated the guy. Oh, the guy forgot. You know, they kind of laughed at it. He told the whole world what he was. I'm a mobster. I kill people for money. I do whatever I want. The law doesn't apply to me. And instead of being condemned for it, he was celebrated. The way he conducted himself was a constant, you know, like the red cape in front of the bull. I think he was inviting them at every turn and every time to come get me. Gotti's lawyer, Bruce Cutler, says there's no reason why Gotti should have toned down his public behavior. Toning things down? What was he toning down? That he went to dinner in Manhattan or that he uh, stayed with his friends? Uh, played cards uh, till uh, uh, the, the uh, early morning hours, which is what he loved to do. The Gotti spin was, he's a tough guy, he's a gambler, he grew up as a tough guy. Uh, what he does is uh, his business, uh, just because he comports himself differently from the way 
the law enforcement officials um, uh, would like him to doesn't mean he's a criminal. In early 1989, Gotti is arrested again. He's charged with ordering a 1986 attack on a carpenter's union boss named John O'Connor. O'Connor reportedly told union carpenters to trash a remodeling job at this Manhattan restaurant because the owners were using non-union workers. Unbeknownst to the union boss, this restaurant was paying tribute to the Gambino crime family, which means John Gotti. And when he heard about it, he ordered the union boss to get busted up. And somebody went and shot the union boss in his butt a couple of times. They tried to kill him, but they shot him in his rear, basically. Gotti is freed on bail and again seems immune to prosecutors' attempts to get him off the streets. He goes back to running the Gambino criminal empire. Gotti doesn't know it, but investigators are close to penetrating the heart of his operation. The FBI's daring plan to get John Gotti when Crime Stories continues. We now return to Crime Stories on Court TV. For most of 1989, John Gotti seems in complete control of his world. He runs the Gambino Empire from his Ravenite Social Club in Manhattan. FBI surveillance cameras record his comings and goings, but it's not nearly enough to prosecute him. You can see these guys with these great videotapes, but yet we didn't have these guys in the right location for their secret meetings. And so we said, maybe we got the wrong place. In the summer of 1989, the FBI obtains secret court orders, allowing agents to place hidden microphones in the Ravenite Club. Their goal is to catch Gotti talking about specific crimes. Earlier attempts to eavesdrop on Gotti produced nothing. But this time, an informant tells agents that Gotti and several of his lieutenants meet regularly in an apartment two floors above the Ravenite. There was a widow named Mrs. Sorelli who lived uh, in apartment number 10 above the Ravenite. Right around Thanksgiving, we found out she was going to go away for Thanksgiving. And we saw her leave with her bags. I think one of her nephews picked her up. And then shortly thereafter, our entry team went into the apartment, put the mic in, and it became operational on November 22, 1989. The bug in Nettie Sorelli's apartment is a daring but very successful move for the FBI. It gives them the evidence they need to go after John Gotti. And that evidence is in John Gotti's own words. They met up there a total of five times. And uh, the second time was the most productive. That was December 12, 1989. During that meeting, FBI agents overhear Gotti attacking Sammy Gravano, who is not around to defend himself. Gotti wonders whether Gravano's various illegal businesses are making him too independent for his own good. Then Gotti makes a fateful mistake. As the FBI listens, he talks about ordering the murders of two Gambino family associates. Once we had that conversation, we knew we had John Gotti because he talked about killing his people in his own words. We knew we had Gotti after that conversation. While the FBI analyzes the tapes, state prosecutors put Gotti on trial for ordering the 1986 shooting of Carpenter's union boss, John O'Connor. Prosecutors hope O'Connor's testimony will help convince the jury to convict Gotti. The state also has a secretly recorded conversation in which Gotti allegedly says of O'Connor, we're gonna bust him up. Simple fact is John O'Connor was shot because John Gotti ordered it teach him a lesson. Bruce Cutler attacks the state's interpretation of Gotti's taped comments. Cutler demands to know how police can be sure they knew what Gotti meant. You know what was in Mr. Gotti's mind when he said that? Yes, sir. You read his mind? I think it's fairly obvious. Do you what know what's saying. in his mind now, Investigator Wright? No, sir, Take I do not. look at him and tell me what he's thinking about. I wish I knew. <laughs> People on the stand got brucified. His come at you like a pit bull, throwing court papers around, jamming stuff in the garbage to show what it's really worth. Throughout the trial, Gotti sits at the defense table, dressed in handmade $2,000 suits. He smiles at friends and reporters. He seems unconcerned about the state's case. As it turns out, Gotti's confidence is well-placed. On February 9, 1990, the jury announces its verdict. I'll say you with respect to defendant John Gotti, guilty or not guilty? You find him not guilty. The prosecutors are stunned. For the third time in a row, John Gotti walks away from the courtroom with a complete and total victory. Jurors tell reporters the state never had a chance. I did not find anything in those tapes that would lead me to believe Mr. Gotti 
had a hand or caused this assault to take place. In a scene that is shown on television newscasts across the nation, John Gotti acknowledges the cheers of his fans as he leaves the courthouse. With this victory, he is crowned the Teflon Don. Little did he know, a little did we know, although some of us began to suspect shortly after that, that by that time, February of 1990, when he was uh, the Teflon Don to the public, his goose was cooked. Methodically, FBI Gambino squad leader Bruce Mao, assistant U.S. attorney Pat Cotter, and others put together what they hope will be the last case against John Gotti. Prosecutors decide early on that any charge against Gotti will have to stand on three separate legs. The three legs would be, first of all, the tapes, second, uh, documentary evidence, and third, if we could get it, actual witnesses. Investigators have Gotti on tape, talking about everything from ordering murders to running the mafia. They're putting together documents to go after Gotti's illegal business dealings. But investigators still don't have any solid witnesses. After all, who would want to testify against the Teflon Don? What a better rep to have if you're a mobster. Because who is going to testify against you now? Even when they had him, he walks out the door. In the fall of 1990, the Gotti investigation intensifies. First, a Gambino crime family member dies in an apparent hit. Then a second member disappears and is presumed dead. Investigators suspect Gotti is involved in both killings. For months, reports have been saying Gotti, Sammy Gravano, and others in the Gambino organization will be indicted on federal racketeering charges. The suspense ends on December 11th, 1990, when FBI agents converge on the Ravenite Club. They were in shock because they knew somebody's coming down. And their worst fears realized we arrested John and Sammy. Once inside the Ravenite, agents get their first chance to explore the headquarters of the country's most powerful mafia boss. They find two small rooms, some cheap furniture, and not much else. The charges against Gotti and Gravano include conspiracy to murder, bribery, extortion, illegal gambling, loan sharking, obstruction of justice, and tax fraud. Agents parade an impeccably dressed Gotti in handcuffs past reporters later that night. John Gotti faces his ultimate courtroom battle when Crime Stories continues. We now return to John Gotti on Crime Stories. FBI agents arrest John Gotti and Sammy Gravano on the night of December 11th, 1990. Gotti shows no sign of distress, perhaps because he believes he will once again beat the federal charges, or maybe because he expects to be out on bail the next day. But the Teflon Don is held without bail until a hearing 10 days later. On December 21st, behind closed doors in Brooklyn Federal Court, prosecutors play tapes they recorded of Gotti's conversations in Nettie Sorelli's apartment. They play them for John Gotti and Sammy Gravano. So I'll never forget, when we play this tape, you have John and Sammy sitting side by side, and you hear John trash and Sammy, he's calling a green-eyed monster, a greedy little so-and-so. While they're playing the tape, John is trying to duck under the table. He's so embarrassed. Sammy's getting hot. He's getting red. This could be, he's fuming. Prosecutors argue that Gotti's bragging about ordering murders makes him too dangerous to be on the streets. Prosecutors also hope the tapes will send another, no less important message to Gotti himself. We were trying, frankly, to suggest to him that it probably isn't a good idea to go around threatening people because listen to the tapes. It's not going to do you any good. You're going to jail on the tapes. So don't go around trying to threaten or kill witnesses or people you think might be witnesses. It won't do you any good. After two days of tapes and testimony, Judge Leo Glasser opens the courtroom to the public. He announces that Gotti and Gravano will be held without bail until their trial. Next, prosecutors go after one of the Teflon Don's most potent courtroom weapons, defense attorney Bruce Cutler. Prosecutors point out that both Cutler and Sammy Gravano's attorney, Gerald Shargell, are heard talking on some of the FBI tapes. Prosecutors know it would violate federal rules to present any evidence that questions the integrity of either Cutler or Shargell. 
Judge Glasser decides the evidence is too important to be excluded. In late July, he issues his order. When John Gotti and Sammy Gravano go to trial, both Cutler and Shargell are off the case. I am just personally offended and angry, and I, and I still cannot fathom that I will not be addressing this jury in this case. This is a crisis for Gotti. He has relied heavily on Cutler's courtroom bravado in his three previous acquittals. But it's nothing compared to the damage Sammy Gravano is about to cause. After hearing the tapes, he is concerned that Gotti may try to blame him for the murders. Gravano sends word to the FBI that he might want to talk. I was seriously concerned that it might be a trick. Uh, I seriously thought at first that Gravano might have been given the orders or even offered to fall on his sword to save Gotti from the murders. Sammy the Bull isn't about to take a fall for John Gotti. Gravano agrees to a deal with prosecutors that requires him to tell all he knows about his own and Gotti's involvement in all the crimes listed in the indictments. Plus, he has to testify against other mobsters for several years in the future. And if he did all that, the government agreed to write a letter to the judge outlining his cooperation. And if it turns out he lied or the judge didn't like what he did or if he held back, the judge could still give him 20 years. In late October 1991, Sammy the Bull becomes what the mafia despises most, a rat. After the FBI removes him from the jail cell he shares with Gotti, Gravano talks. He gives investigators a gold mine of information. He admits taking part in 19 separate murders. He also describes in great detail how he and Gotti planned and carried out several killings, including the hit on Gambino boss Paul Castellano. Gotti knows that Gravano is turned against him. With the trial set to start in early 1992, Gotti has little time to find a new lawyer. He eventually settles on a well-known attorney from Miami, Albert Krieger. Krieger has about four months to prepare a defense. He's ready as the trial begins on January 21st. The first order of business is to pick a jury. No easy task for a John Gotti trial. I can't tell you how many jurors sat in the jury room when we were questioning them and cried. One woman was shaking so bad she could not speak. She could not speak just because she was in the presence of this guy. Judge Glasser goes to extraordinary lengths to protect the jury. Jurors go to and from the Brooklyn courthouse in tightly guarded limousines. They're sequestered in hotels for the duration of the trial. Their names are never revealed to either the prosecution or the defense. The heart of the government's case against Gotti is the series of secretly recorded conversations from Nettie Sorelli's apartment above the Ravenite Social Club. Prosecutors believe the tapes alone should be enough to convict the Teflon Don. There's nothing better than playing a tape turning to the defense and say, you're witness, cross-examine the tape recorder. To demonstrate Gotti's control of the Gambino crime family, prosecutors play a conversation in which Gotti says he might be going to prison. Gotti is heard asking Gravano what he wants to do if that happens. So I'm asking you, how you feel? You want to sing this good here? Or you want me to make you official underboss, the boss? How do you feel? What makes you feel better? On another tape, Gotti passionately defends his way of life in the mob, his life in Cosa Nostra. This is going to be our Cosa Nostra till I die. Be it an hour from now, be it tonight, or 100 years from now, I'm in jail. It's going to be our Cosa Nostra. But those comments are mild compared to the tape on which Gotti talks about ordering the hit on a Gambino associate, Louis de Bono. They hear your voice and they hear you speaking. There's, n there's not much room for interpretation. There's not much Bruce Cutler can do. There's not much anybody could do. When they, when they have you on tape, you're dead. <laughs> it's just a matter of where you're going to fall down. But prosecutors are just getting started. Sammy the Bull Gravano turns on John Gotti when Crime Stories continues. We now return to John Gotti on Crime Stories. John Gotti's final trial begins in February of 1992. It attracts everyone from picketers to paparazzi. Some Hollywood tough guys show up to pay their respects. Actors Mickey Rourke, John Amos, 
and Anthony Quinn reinforce the notion that John Gotti is somehow a victim of government persecution. But it's a different story in the courtroom. When Sammy the Bull Gravano takes the witness stand against John Gotti, he opens the door on the Mafia's most closely guarded secrets. Gravano shows no emotion as he describes the murders he helped Gotti carry out. Gravano's testimony is riveting, but prosecutors want the jury not to forget their most important evidence, John Gotti's own voice on tape. You should convict him on that alone. It's more than enough. If that's not more than enough, we give you Sam Gravano. Sam Gravano confirms everything you hear on the tape, plus he tells you a few other things. Defense attorney Albert Krieger attacks the tapes as irrelevant and Gravano's testimony as nothing more than an attempt to save his own skin. But to many in the courtroom, the case against Gotti seems overwhelming. When Krieger moves to call witnesses on Gotti's behalf, Judge Glasser allows only one from the list Krieger submits. Gotti's tax attorney, Murray Appleman, testifies that he advised Gotti not to file tax returns over a seven-year period. After presenting this lone witness, the defense rests. How do you present witnesses to make the tapes go away? How do you present a witness to tell the jury that what Sammy said he didn't say? You can't. The jury gets the case on the afternoon of April 1st, 1992. Jurors ask to hear several tapes again, then retire for the night. At one o'clock the next afternoon, after nearly 14 hours of deliberation, they reach a decision. They brought the jury out. They asked the foreperson to read. Um, I took a long look at Gotti, and then I went back to my paper because I was recording the verdicts as they came in on each count. The verdicts come quickly and dramatically. On each count, the jury says the government has proven its case. John Gotti is guilty of murder conspiracy, bribery, extortion, illegal gambling, loan sharking, obstruction of justice, and tax fraud. For the first time since he assumed control of the Gambino crime family, Gotti is headed for prison. Today, another milestone in the fight against organized crime. The Teflon is gone, the Don is covered with Velcro, and every charge in the indictment stuck. The jury did not give adequate consideration to the defense arguments, did not give more than that adequate consideration to the evidence. We were dealing with murderers, and we did what we had to do to stop them, and we did. And I don't make any apologies for that. Two months after the trial ends, Judge Leo Glasser sentences John Gotti to life in prison without parole. Outside the courthouse, hundreds of Gotti supporters stage a riot, overturning police cars and threatening to invade the building. Bruce Cutler tries to reassure the crowd that the fallen Don is okay. John took his sentence. He doesn't care about himself, but he cares about his friends, his family, and you folks out there. At the maximum security prison in Marion, Illinois, he spends 23 hours a day alone in a small cell. He is not allowed any contact with other prisoners. Gotti has been allowed out of Marion one time to undergo surgery after doctors discovered he had throat cancer. John Gotti's not a stupid man. No question about it, he's not stupid. And he knows, I believe, that he's history, that he's in jail forever, and that can't sit well with him. The loss of John Gotti cripples the Gambino crime family. If you look at what the Gambinos have become today, they're a joke, but that didn't just happen. That happened because Sammy Gravano blew them up from inside. And because of that, an organization that killed dozens of people a year, a year, that threatened hundreds, thousands, and extorted millions, is out of business for all intents and purposes. They're gone. It is hardly the legacy John Gotti would have wanted, but public fascination remains for the man who was the Dapper Don, then the Teflon Don. His attorney, Bruce Cutler, thinks he knows why. His legend will grow over time because of the way he is. He's an old time tough man and uh, he wasn't going to change uh, to placate anyone else. Uh, he was devoted to his own life and taking care of his family and that's how he saw things. The Gotti family legacy continues. Gotti's son, John Jr., is now serving his own prison sentence. The younger Gotti recently pled guilty to a variety of federal racketeering charges. He was sentenced to seven years in prison. 
if he behaves himself, John Jr., unlike his father, could be out in four. For Crime Stories, I'm Richard Belzer.